Okay. Well, let's take a look at them. Here is the simplest glycerophospholipid. It's called phosphatidic acid. Now, I want you to think back to the fat. A fat, I said, had a glycerol backbone, and it had three fatty acids. The glycerol backbone was a carbon, carbon, carbon. There's our carbon, carbon, carbon. In the case of the fat, we had fatty acid, fatty acid, fatty acid. In this case, we have fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate. So phosphatidic acid is the simplest glycerophospholipid. And what it has is a glycerol backbone with two fatty acids, and it has a single phosphate. Now, that structure, that phosphate right there, changes the chemical properties of this molecule from a fat very significantly. Very significantly. The fat basically was totally hydrophobic. There was nothing about it that liked associating with water, and that's why fats are stored in specialized cells called adipocytes. Okay? They're stored in specialized cells so they can be away from water. Fat does not like water. We put the phosphate on this guy right here, and now we create a molecule that is amphiphilic. An amphiphilic molecule has a portion of itself that's very hydrophobic. So here's these very hydrophobic tails sticking off, and here's a very polar head, the phosphate. Now, if you think about fatty acids themselves, they have that property as well. One end has a carboxyl group, the other end is very nonpolar. We use fatty acids to make soaps because soaps can have the very polar part sticking out and touching water and the nonpolar part picking up grease. Okay? So they have the ability to interact with both of those, and that's how they solubilize grease when we wash our hands. These guys, the phosphatidic acid derived compounds, they associate with each other such that the nonpolar tails stick with each other of different glycerophospholipids, and the polar heads associate with water. Now I'll show you how a membrane looks in a minute, but I just want to plant that idea in your head. Okay. Now, when we take phosphatidic acid and we put something on the phosphate, we create something called a phosphatidyl compound. All right, so this is a little nomenclature that we need to understand. So phosphatidic acid, yes, you should know the general structure of phosphatidic acid, the general structure. Carbon, 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 fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate, that's phosphatidic acid. Okay. Now, a phosphatidyl compound has the very same structure the difference being we've added something onto the phosphate. That's that little R right there. So let's say that R is serine, the amino acid serine. What we did, what we would do if we created that, we would create something called phosphatidyl serine. So we name it according to what that R group is. Phosphatidyl serine, we could have phosphatidyl choline, we could have phosphatidyl ethanolamine, we could have phosphatidyl kevin if we put kevin on there. Okay? I know you would like to think of that, but that's, so, that, so you get the idea. So the R group determines what the end part of that name is. Okay. Yeah, phosphatidyl choline, phosphatidyl ethanolamine. It depends on what that, that R group is, is put onto there in terms of what we name it. Okay. Ah, here's a bunch of phosphatidyl compounds. No, you're not going to have to memorize them. I'm just showing them to you. But you can see now, what we've done is we've sort of twisted this around so that we can see. Here's those nonpolar tails sticking out. Here's the polar end. And so we can see here's one end that's polar, one end that's nonpolar. Nonpolar, polar, nonpolar, polar. And so schematically, they look kind of like this. Okay? One end very polar, the other end very nonpolar. Now, instead of acting like a detergent, these compounds have other properties that are very interesting and very important for cells. Okay? I need to jump down here to show you this before I go forwards. Okay? So I'm going to jump down to the figure 810. Let me move forward in your, in your notes a little bit. Up. Okay. And now we can start to see how these compounds arrange themselves. 
Detergents will arrange themselves, you remember, in sort of a ball. And they made that little ball around that droplet of oil and they carried it away. These guys don't make a ball. They make what's called a lipid bilayer. And that's because they've got two tails hanging off of them. Instead of fatty acid, it only has one tail. These guys have two tails and they're too big to make a ball. So they sort of make themselves in a row across the top and a row across the bottom. The inside of this guy has the nonpolar tails totally away from water. They really like each other and they exclude water. It, this is what a membrane actually looks like. Okay? So this is the so-called lipid bilayer of the membrane. The lipid bilayer is arranged so that this will wrap all the way around a cell, kind of like you see here. So here's a cell encased by a membrane. It's been sort of cut a cross section through it. And we can see that we have an inside of the cell. So this might be the bottom part might be inside, for example. And we have an outside layer out here. And in between there, we have this very nonpolar barrier. This double nature, where we have polar, notice these guys are charged up here, these guys are charged down here, and they're uncharged in the middle. This double barrier prevents the movement of things across the membrane very easily. So the lipid bilayer is a very effective barrier to the movement of molecules. That's important. The cell doesn't want things coming and going as it wishes, just like your parents didn't want you coming and going when you were 14 years old. You had a curfew, right? You couldn't just come and go as you chose. The cell doesn't want to have things coming and going as it, without its control because that might include poison of some sort. So the cell wants to control what's going to come in and what's coming out, so it makes this barrier of a lipid bilayer. Make sense? Yes? You said the double barrier, is that in regard to having two sets of lipids, or is that in regard to polar and nonpolar? It's, it's in regards to polar and nonpolar. So thanks for asking, Linda. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's imagine I've got a nonpolar poison that comes along. It hits this polar layer right here. It doesn't go any further because it doesn't interact. Let's say I've got a very polar poison. It comes along, it interacts with this layer okay, but it gets in here, what's going to happen? It's going to get repelled. So that double layer provides very good protection against both types of molecules. Now, it's not absolute. I don't want to tell you it's an impenetrable barrier because there are things that can and do get through. Okay? But it's a pretty effective barrier. We want some things to pass through fairly readily. And it turns out there are four molecules that we can think of that pass through a lipid bilayer very readily. One of them is water. Water passes through that layer surprisingly well. We don't need to go into the chemistry of why, but it does. Another one is oxygen. Cells need oxygen. And if we had to transport oxygen across the cell membrane, we'll, we'll discover later that transport systems are relatively slow we would have a hard time getting enough oxygen into cells. Oxygen turns out to move very readily across there. Something else that moves readily across the membrane is something we want to get rid of, and that's carbon dioxide. So it's nice that, cell, that carbon dioxide can escape from cells very readily, go back out into the bloodstream, get carried to the lungs, and you exhale it. If carbon dioxide were to build up at too high of a level, your cells would acidify and you would die. So the membrane is letting that pass through. Very, very good. The fourth thing that passes through is something else we don't want passing through, and that's carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide passes through the membranes pretty darn readily. So there's four important things that go there. OK, you guys are looking like you might want a song, so I thought we might take a break and do a song. Is that OK? Now, I said last time, if we don't sing, then, you know, it's like I'm up here singing alone. So I want you to sing with me today. Will you do that? <laughs> oh, if I knew something about key, I would gladly do that. I, my wife always says the same thing, you know. You go too fast, okay, and you sing too high. You know, I, I don't know. I'll try. How's that? Okay, this is a song that uh, I think you guys know. It's to the tune of uh, This Land is Your Land.
This land is your land. This land is my land. Okay. Low, low. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let me get my get it set up here, and then we'll sing a song. You'll notice this was written for a different term, so the, uh, the the time that I talk about is not right for this class. I need to change it, but we'll see. Okay. It's called this song's for BB three five zero. It's one o'clock and Ahern's talking, Henderson and Hasselbach and PKAs and buffers I should know. This song's for BB350. I hope he, that maybe he'll think the way we wrote our answers wasn't crazy. I really need the partial credit, so this band's for BB450. It's really groovy that it improves me. Watching lectures and quick time movies. I really need to go and download those podcasts for BB350. I'm feeling manic. I'm in a panic. I'd better study my old organic. It has reactions that I need to know. This song's for BB350. I know he said it, that's why I dread it, cause I skip Fridays. Extra credit will probably haunt me, that lowly zero grade in BB350. It could be steric or esoteric. That cartons get so anomeric. I'm too hysteric. Better let it go. This song's for BB350. Okay. Good night. Okay. That loosened up a little bit, I hope. You guys do seem tired today, so it's Friday. What, what days do you have lab before you come here? You have lab before you come here, is that right? It's just late in the day. Somebody said there was a lab before here. Is that not right? Or a class, a big class before here? Does it? Tuesdays only. So I can't. I can't blame the tiredness on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Of it's just the four o'clock business. Okay. You guys are ready to go home, and I'm not going to let you go home yet. So. Oh come on, Kevin. Right. So. Uh, I would ask for wild plans for the weekend, but I'd probably get shot because I know what your plans for the weekend probably are. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So let's uh, let, we'll we'll finish early. I'll I'll do that. How's that? Uh, I'm not going to stop here. Um, I'll say a couple more things and then I will finish, and you can go out and enjoy the sun. How's that? Okay. Okay. All right. So. Um, Let's uh, now what I do, want to do is go back and talk about a couple more compounds. Your book is a little schizophrenic, as which is why I'm having to jump around a little bit to show you these things, um, and talk about uh, a couple of other compounds that are important. Okay, one is a group of compounds that aren't even related, but your book puts them together in the same figure. Okay, so these are totally unrelated compounds. The top ones are what we call waxes. Okay, you know wax. You got wax in your ear, and you go ugh, right? Okay. Waxes are very, very hydrophobic compounds. They're like fats in that respect. They are not fats, however. They don't have a glycerol backbone. They tend to have two long fatty acids joined to each other. As a result, they have no part of them that's very polar. They're very, very nonpolar. They don't like water at all. And that's why we wax our floors, for example. It repels water. We wax our car. You get your car waxed and you put water on it and it makes little droplets of water because it doesn't associate with that at all. Okay? So waxes, for our purposes, is probably the only time in the whole term I'll even mention the term wax. It won't be a factor for us. What I will mention more about, though, are the group of compounds that are on the bottom. And these are called the sphingolipids. And that's, yeah, S-P-H-I-N-G-O. That's a PH, not a spingo, but a spingo. S P H I N G O L I P I D. It's a sphingolipid. It's a category of compounds. Sphingolipids. Okay? Now, sphingolipids have general shapes that are rather like glycerophospholipids. They're not glycerol based. I want to emphasize that. So they don't have a glycerol backbone. But they kind of look like glycerophospholipids. 